Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Uh, you may always have had a bent to anthropology, but I think you became a professional anthropologist by rather slow degrees, didn't you? You read something else at Cambridge. Well, yes, it, it was an accident. I, when I was at Cambridge, I had no idea I was going to be an anthropologist. I came up to read uh, mathematics and went on to read engineering, which I took my degree in engineering. Um, there were other things that happened in Cambridge which I suppose slanted me towards anthropology. I, it was a great day of Cambridge Theatre, the Cambridge Festival Theatre, a famous repertory, uh, which certainly influenced me a great deal of uh, sort of tending to be interested in theatre and seeing life as theatre, which ultimately get fed into my anthropology. But at that time, I had no idea. I just, uh, when I graduated, uh, it was a bad slump, and I just like now. And I joined a British firm in China, Butterfield and Soi, and after spending a year in London. I went out to Shanghai and was in China for three and a half years. Um, that is until the end of uh, 1936. Uh, and um, I was posted in various places, in Chongqing, in Tsingtao, and eventually in Peking. Um, and you began to be interested in uh, uh, Anthropo anthropological matters at that time, did you, in a, an amateurish way, perhaps? Well, I travelled a great deal and made a point of every time I had the chance, I got to the most obscure parts of China, uh, borders of Tibet and borders of Mongolia and so on. So I saw much more of China than I think the ordinary visitor did. I mean, uh, China to me is a very varied country, a vast country. Uh, and it was an enormous uh, for a young man to be impressed by the extreme, extraordinary situation of here was a great civilization which of immense antiquity, which is completely viable as far as was, and yet did everything exactly the other way around. I mean, as a young man, one got the impression that everything was back to front. I mean, you know, the, 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 the men wore skirts, the women wore trousers. I mean, it was like, it was like that. And in all sorts of ways, it is in fact true that the uh, Chinese solution to basic problems is rather the reverse of the European problem. And uh, this gradually filtered into my interests, I think. Could you, could you give one or two instances of the way in which they reverse the solutions? Uh, does it show up in, uh, in various objects, rituals? Well, uh, there are all sorts of ways in which, uh, I mean, they have a very, uh, I mean, we have a, a kind of religion which is a very distinct system of the Christian system, which is, can be seen as a distinct religion. Often today the Chinese have no religion, and yet they are, their whole life is surrounded by rituals of various kinds. Uh, and their architecture is very closely related to cosmology to a degree which ours is not, and they're consciously so. Uh, and this interested me a great deal, the, the whole matter of Chinese architecture and the abstractions of Chinese architecture, which are quite different from ours. I mean, the, the Temple of Heaven in Peking with its marvellous symmetrical forms. You know, the, sky, the, the roof is, is the sky and the, the ground at the bottom is the, is the earth. I mean, it's, it's sort of a... Uh, everything is consciously symbolised in various ways. Uh, but also, I found that... Uh, you know, it seems to me that European art, even when we become self-consciously abstract. We're still in somehow copying nature. There's a very, it goes right back to uh, 
Greeks that somehow art is a form of imitating nature at one remove, making abstractions out of nature. Whereas Chinese much more consciously seem to make nature fit their own ideas. I mean, you don't, never, in your make, painting a picture, you never copy it from nature. You think about it, and then you paint it. But in the same way, having done that, you then make the nature look like look like what's your idea. So that the idea of a mountain, the actual Chinese sacred mountains, which I climbed, there were five, and I climbed three of them, uh, they had been made to look like the pictures, uh, with steps all the way up them, so they didn't climb them, uh, rather than the pictures made to look like the mountains. I mean, the, 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 the pictures are like the mountains, but it's, it's a sort of back-to-front way of, of thinking about it. All sorts of aspects of that, that the ideas come first and the, and the facts afterwards, I think, in some ways. Yeah. One of the things I got very interested in in China, uh, besides architecture, were ancient Chinese jades. I mean, the same way off, but I mean, these are mainly grave goods, uh, which are sort of formal archaeology, okay? Uh, and w they're not jade as we now think of them, they're all bright green. They're, they're stone objects of various kinds, which played a very important part in ancient Chinese rituals. Ancient, I'm talking about 1000 BC. Uh, for example, this object here, this disc with bubbles on it, has a very complicated cosmological significance. But here is a point where it is different from our appreciation. So the Chinese appreciation of this is the feel of it, the actual the sensory touch, and the sensory touch is, is what is appreciated rather than simply the shape of what it is, though the shape comes into it again. Now here, for example, is a pig, which is Zhou Dynasty's, 1000 BC perhaps, I don't know, perhaps not quite much there. And you notice it's already highly abstract. Uh, it's a pig, you can see it's a pig, but it's a very abstracted kind of pig. And it's beautifully lovely to touch. And then again, here's another pig, which is even more abstract. And the two of them, you see, I mean, they're carrying, pressing all to, to just the, the formal abstraction of these ideas. Now, I'm cheating a bit here because I acquired these tortoises after I'd become an anthropologist, so that it's not absolutely straightforward there. But I acquired them in Hong Kong in 1956, actually. But here one is becoming very anthropological, because clearly they are tortoises. But they're not straight tortoises. I mean, the, this tortoise has a, has a human face. He's a bearded old man, lascivious male, and uh, a lovely creature. And the other one is quite obviously female. And uh, actually, she's rather like a Pekingese. I mean, if you have an actually own a Pekingese, uh, and uh, she's been courted, the Pekingese will behave just like like that. Uh, the Pygnese doesn't have a split tail anymore, the caucus, a, a tortoise has a split tail. But this is linked up with the whole of Chinese civilization in a very complicated way that uh, Chinese writing came out of oracle bones which used tortoise shells for making oracles and there's a whole blending here of animal characters and human characters and now I can see that this is really very deep, involves a whole lot of anthropological notions. But certainly my interest in Chinese jades sort of led me somehow along the road where I was likely to pick up anthropological ideas. So Cambridge provided um, more or less unwittingly mathematics, engineering and drama in the making of you as an anthropologist, and then China gave you a view of a, of a culture which uh, formulates the formulates reality in a quite different way. So you, you became more and more interested in that aspect. So you were on, well on the way now to becoming a full-scale anthropologist. What happened next? Well, I, I had traveled around and seen some odd corners of China. 
But right at the end, when I decided to come home and I'd resigned from my firm, I had some time to waste, in a way, and I joined up, I was in Pekin, I joined up with a rather eccentric American, uh, and we went off to an island called Bottle Tobago, which is off the coast of Formosa, which is, was then Japanese territory, it is now Taiwanese territory, which was a, a very small island with about 1,500 so-called very primitive people, uh, the Yami. And this was absolutely bowled me over. I mean, I didn't know anything anthropology at all. But this fantastic experience of, we were the first Europeans to be on this island since right at the beginning of the century, and very few Europeans had ever been there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't know any anthropology. I, I was an engineer. I could draw, I drew beautiful pictures, uh, drawings of their boats and their houses and asked a lot of questions, but I, uh, the questions I asked were, were quite not bad, but they were not quite the right questions I'd ask now. Uh, and when, it was after that, I, had, I was there about two and a half months, my partners were there longer. Well, when I got back home, I had all this, this stuff from this island, and I felt I ought to find out whether it was of any interest. And I happened to have a contact with um, anthropology and through Raymond Firth, and I hadn't then met, but had subsequently been my closest friend. And I took it along to him and said, look here, I've been to this island, all this stuff, here's photographs and pictures and so on. Is it of any interest? And he said, well, yes, it's very interesting, but of course you've asked the wrong question. Uh, but nevertheless, you'd better come and meet Malinowski. Now, Malinowski at that time was this famous professor at the London School of Economics, was a very charismatic figure and had created enmities all round, but was a tremendously powerful personality. And if he liked you, he liked you, and if he didn't like you, that was out. And for Goodness knows, for some reason or other, he decided he liked me. And for the next, and it turns out I only knew Malinowski for about 18 months, perhaps even less, because then he went off to America. I was completely, un, you know, I was donged as it were. I mean, very powerful. And it was really, Malinowski decided I was going to be an anthropologist, and <laughs> that was that. <laughs> and I, um, it was the most exciting experience of, of my life was this, this, this year and a bit working with Malinowski, uh, attending his seminars, going to his house, talking to him and so on. And um, however, he went to America in 38. So then I worked with Firth as his research assistant for, for a year, and that was a very valuable experience, working with someone who was, who was writing a book. And um, he, I worked with Firth on the writing of the book and learnt what anthropologists do. And then in 1939, I went again, this time I abandoned going to Kurdistan, I went to Burma, edging back to China, you see. Mm -hmm. I was going to work right on the edge of Burma and China. Uh, the complicated reasons why I should go there. But uh, then, of course, the war really did break out, and that kept me in Burma for on and off, Burma and India for the next uh, six years. So you went to Burma as an anthropologist, and then you then the war broke out, so you had to combine it with other things. Oh, indeed, I I, I intended to be in in Burma just for fifteen months or something like that to do a very stock type of uh, an anthropological study of a, of a community, which part of which I did. But I was actually for the next five years I was a member of the Burma Army, but partly because. Uh, the war in Burma didn't mean very much until the Japanese Pearl Harbor affair, and partly because I was a sort of misfit from the army point of view anyway, as a sort of rather eccentric kind of character. Uh, I managed to fit in quite a lot of anthropology along with my military service because in the end I was a very irregular kind of uh, soldier, 
And this took me to most extraordinary parts of Burma, which I could never have got to, except that the government hadn't been prepared to you know, sort of drop me there or push me there or something, one, one way or another. You were very uh, much a loner. I mean, you were not uh, in a regular military formation. Uh, well, I, uh, until the Japanese uh, chased us out, I was officially a member of the third Burma Rifles, but I was seconded to various other things. I was on something called X-List. Uh, and uh, at that point, I was seconded to something called Burma Levies, which didn't really exist. And subsequently, I was uh, uh, seconded to something called Kachin Levies, which uh, only existed when I'd sort of rather created it one way or another. Um, and then I got very unpopular with the, with the military and was eventually a, a kind of civilian. I was, a I was a, as we went back into Burma eventually, there had to be a civilian, a military civilian service. And I was, uh, I was attached to this. I, I was rather high up in this, this particular non-military military operation. Um, but this led to me seeing a lot of Burma. I mean, I was theoretically a lot of the time behind the Japanese lines, but there were no Japanese lines to be behind, so it wasn't as daring as it sounds. But I, I did have lots of fun. Well, I was demobilized early in, in uh, 1946, I, I, because I'd been seen service right through, yeah. also I got early demobilization. I was then still very uncertain whether to be an anthropologist, but I'd got all this material, and I made contact with Firth again, who was now professor at the LSE. I discussed it with him, and he said, well, why don't you uh, work on this material that you had at first hand, and go back to the literature and see if you can make sense of the literature in the light of your unique experience. And I did this, and my PhD was, in fact, that I've been resumed. There was you know, a seven-year gap between the yeah. pair. And uh, it is a bookwork thesis uh, in which I read Obsidian everything that had been written about the Kachins from 1800 onwards. Uh, and um, in the light of my own experience. And um, as soon as I'd finished that, which was in 47, I was taken on the staff of the LSE. I went to Borneo to do a special reconnaissance of Sarawak to plan certain research projects, which were rather surprisingly carried out, but not by me. Uh, I was then had several years teaching in LSE. Uh, in 1953, I agreed to move to Cambridge, uh, where Fortis had taken on as professor. Mm. So in the interval between actually going to Cambridge and leaving the LSE, I did my fieldwork in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka, about which I wrote a book, which was not published in London. One. Uh, and since then, I'm, I was actually on the staff in, in, in Cambridge on the faculty since 1953. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I consider I've been a, a serious professional anthropologist since about, I suppose, 1946. I mean, I'd done quite a lot of anthropology before. So, that. You say you were about, about 37 when that. Uh when you became a serious professional anthropologist? I was actually finally committed, yes, I was born in 1910, so that I could say I was 37 when I was absolutely mm -hmm. burnt my boats and no question of <laughs> going, recrossing the Rubicon or anything like that. And all the, at this time, you were, you were still very much uh, of the British school of uh, anthropology, I mean, the, the, as represented by Firth. And oh, I'm, very uh, much yes. so, you see, I mean, I, my, I had, in fact, in Burma, uh, written a very Firthian Malinovskian monograph on, about the Kachins, which 
was lost to the Japanese, but it was, I, I mean, it was a pure, pure piece of functionalist study. What would be the, uh, um, uh, how would you describe the main features of functionalist anthropological studies? Well, it grew up out of uh, Malinowski's studies of the island of Kirowina in the Trobrand Islands in Melanesia, which he, was, uh, he studied between 1914 and 1918. And um, in Firth's case, the study of Tikapia, which is a small Polynesian island of three square miles in size and 1,200 people. And it, they tended to take for granted uh, that uh, the community they were studying had clear-cut geographical boundaries and that uh, also boundaries of a social kind in time and space, as it were. So that you, uh, you studied this society as you observed it over a period of one year, two years, or as long as you could, but sort of photographically, in, in, an instantaneous holding picture of the society. And you didn't worry too much about how it had come to be like that. You didn't worry at all. You rather tended to imagine that it had always been like that. And you didn't worry too much about its contacts with other parts of the world. You were concerned with the micro-sociology, you might say, of how the institutions which you observed directly fitted together like the gear wheels of a watch. Now this is a very valuable thing because no previous kind of sociology had ever been at this minuscule level and the kinds of discoveries that were made about the way things fit together are perfectly valid discoveries. Uh, the weakness was that it was lacking in dynamism and it, was, it tends to produce a very static picture. But um, this didn't worry me as a, as my engineering point of view, because I'd always thought in, in mathematics one always learnt statics before and learnt dynamics, and dynamics didn't seem to be very different from statics, it was sort of, you know, yeah. just, it was sort of added a bit. But, um, but there were lots of rival uh, um, views of what anthropology ought to be at that time, and of course some of them have grown more notorious. Well, yes, since. I mean, in the... Um, uh, for, uh, Radcliffe Brown was also a functionalist, when, uh, a contemporary of, Rad of Malinowski's, uh, had a very peripatetic career and but came back to Oxford in 1936. And he was a, a devoted follower of Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist, though he took a rather narrow view of what Durkheimian sociology was about. Uh, and to some extent, he was interested in the comparison of societies uh, as types. He was interested rather in the man manner of Max Weber, the, 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 the uh, German sociologist, that he thought of societies as corresponding to certain ideal types, which could then be set on, up on a kind of taxonomy. And eventually, you would have a scientific sociology in which types of societies were like the types of mam mammals and types of insects yeah. and so on. And it was a very botanical way of thinking about it. And, uh, but here again, he, he was concerned with how institutions fit together to make a system, an articulated system, rather like the skeleton of a, uh, of a mammal. Uh, but I was never directly associated with Red Brown, except that he was my examiner of my PhD thesis, which, which I am uh, thanks. Uh, and I knew him personally, but I never had contact with him academically. Yeah. Would this be because of your mechanistic bent, you were rather opposed to this biological approach? Well, uh, it, it was simply principally because a rivalry had grown up between Oxford anthropologists under Radcliffe Brown and London anthropologists under under Firth, but I dare say this is true that my my model making was much more uh, mechanistic and abstract of a you know, whereas um, Radcliffe Brown, who fancied himself rather as a uh, as a mathematician, but didn't seem to me even know any mathematics, 
um, did use his models, uh, biological models, to a degree which I found was rather naive. Um, but of course, uh, there was all, later Evans Pritchard, who had been succeeded now at Radcliffe Brown at Oxford, uh, and had originally been very close to Radcliffe Brown, later deviated from his position very widely by uh, reinstating an interest in history and in ideology as opposed to, uh, and in some ways moved rather closer to Levi Strauss. I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, Levi Strauss. I mean, it's obvious to us that your uh, formal training has been in the English functionalist school. Why did Levi Strauss have uh, such importance for you? Uh, well, it's a bit of a long story, but it, it's, it's like this. Levi Strauss um, his background, anthropological background, was really taken up from the American cultural anthropologists or ethnologists, as the English would call them, particularly Lowy. And um, in 1940s, the end of the war, he was in New York and became closely associated with the famous linguist, Euroman Jakobsen, and clearly picked up a great many ideas from Jakobsen and wanted to apply Jakobsen's ideas to the kind of comparative cultural anthropology which he had learned from the Americans. His major application of this was in this book which was published in 19... 49 originally on the elementary structures of kinship in the first French edition, which is a comparative study of kinship systems, essentially kinship terminologies, kinship terminologies for father, son, brother, son, cousin, and so on, uh, over a geographical area stretching from Australia to Siberia. Now, the study of kinship terminologies is a kind of anthropological freak, which goes back to the latter part of the 19th century, which was started by Morgan. The idea that a kinship terminology system, the system of the use of words, reflects, is a corresponds to the type of society. Uh, and uh, Lewis Strauss tried to show that by comparing the kinship terminologies and the formal rules of marriage over this large geographical area, he could arrive at certain fundamental principles about exchange systems as reflected in, in marriage. You could have types of, of exchange where the marriage was reciprocal to the two sides exchanged brides, or you could have them asymmetrical where one side gave a bride and the other side did not. Now, uh, this is far removed from British functionalist social anthropology. However, the central axis point, the sort of focal point of uh, Lewis Strauss's massive volume was the chapter relating to the Kachins of North Burma, which was based, of course, on rather antique uh, ethnographic fact before I'd ever got there, uh, and was in many cases, many details wrong. I mean, the, the uh, the ethnography was wrong. But this was the central chapter of the book about which the, the, the thing really hung. And I was fascinated because these were the people I'd worked with throughout the war. And I, I really knew about my kitchen. And what baffled me was that although Levi Strauss's ethnographic facts, a simple recording of custom, was in many cases quite wrong, nevertheless, his method had arrived at certain insights about the, the underlying principles of which the sister society worked, which no one previous to him had perceived. And indeed, I'm not sure how far I'd perceived it. At the moment he said this, it was quite obvious that this was, he got it back to front, <laughs> upside down. Like <laughs> and nevertheless, Chinese. this didn't matter very much. <laughs> I mean, he'd, he'd understood something about the society which no one else had understood. And this fascinated me, how it could come to be that someone could be wrong on his facts, but right somehow about the theory. And this runs through my later of my interest in, in, uh, 
in structuralist anthropology has been this relation between the ethnographic facts and the underlying theory. Later, of course, Levi-Strauss moved right away from uh, the comparative study of kinship systems to the comparative studies of myths. And here again, the same principle applied, that his, his big book on myths, his four-volume work, is a comparative study of the mythologies mainly of American Indians stretching from Patagonia to Alaska, but particularly for the South American Indians, uh, where the myth is, you know, it's, it's very second-hand. It's stuff which is translated into Spanish and Portuguese and then into French and so on. It's very far removed from the original stuff. Uh, and he is comparing mythologies as if they were separated from the societies which produced them. Uh, and yet he seems to be able to say something very interesting about these mythologies, even though they are unrelated to the societies in which generated them. And uh, certain of my key pupils were Stephen Hugh Jones who is, and his wife, who you know, because uh, Stephen is a fellow of King, uh, you know, purposely, I said, well, I sent them to the field in South America, to the Amazon, the upper Amazon, to an area where I knew that the Strossian kind of myth prevailed, to find out what's it like on the ground if you actually look at this stuff in detail. And whereas Levi Strauss's account of a myth may occupy a couple of paragraphs, perhaps, uh, the Hugh Jones's myth, you know, it runs for 80 hours of, of tape, I mean, it just goes on and on. And yet, their studies are in a way very functionalist in that they're concentrated studies of a single longhouse community in the upper Vopes, a, a, a very local. Nevertheless, they find that in a certain sort of way, the levi Straussian analysis is very penetrating and illuminating for this detailed functionist analysis, so that in their case they have, as it were, amalgamated the two traditions. Can I interrupt, though, just to get this clear? Um, it's the fact that uh, levi Strauss is so often wrong about ethnographical detail, and you were able to show this yourself because of your knowledge, and the Hugh Jones has done the same thing, it makes it even more impressive that the that the insights are so often correct and made you thought that the theory which owed so much to Jakobsen must have something in it. Is that the way it works? This is the way I'm yeah. thinking of. You see that uh, Levi Strauss, like, is because he's coming at it as a, he's trying to apply a, a theory of linguistics to the That's what I want to ask you. How does that work? Well, of course, uh, Jakobsen the key thing for Jakobsen's linguistics, which comes from de Saussure, much earlier in the century, but in Jakobsen's case, it is concerned with phonology. How do we actually pick up a message from a, a flow of speech? A flow of speech is, uh, at an objective level, is a, is a pattern of, of sound on, on the breath, imposed on the breath. Uh, and this pattern, when you write it down, uh, consists of uh, uh, vowels and consonants and, uh, uh, and accents and intonations and, uh, and so on, al alternating with one another. Uh, and yet we uh, are not only capable of grafting this coded message onto, the, onto our breath, but we are able to decode it again and turn it into a, a meaningful message. And Jakobsen is interested, first of all, how do we do this? That we clearly, it's inconceivable in view of the vast variety of human languages that there are, that our mental apparatus can be so sophisticated that it can, as it were, decode anything if they were all different. It must, there must be some very fundamental principles which it operates on. And uh, Jakobsen talks about distinctive features uh, in, La in Levi Strauss, in the argument, binary oppositions. The, the very small number of oppositions which, which we can recognize. We don't, can't recognize them consciously, we recognize them unconsciously. We recognize unconsciously the difference between the 
hard sound p, a p and the soft sound b, a b, and so that pit is not the same as bit. But uh, I mean, that's all, it's just a single alternation, a very, very fine grade, and the whole, whole phonology, according to Jacobson and friends, is built up on a very limited number of distinct, distinctive, fe distinctive features which can decode the whole, the whole system. And so Lewis Strauss, but this is in the mind. Yeah. It is not out there. It is something in the mind. And Lewis Strauss is arguing that when customary behaviors must similarly be coded in this sort of way, so that uh, when we do, when we act in certain customary way, we are possibly not acting in some, uh, in as it were, the opposite way, whatever the opposite way is. And that this again conveys a message which is in the mind. Now this is very tricky. What do we, what do we mean by in the mind? I mean the whole, um, whole functionalist tradition has been very much empirical observing what people do out there, uh, recording the fact, everything that the functionalist does, as it were, is something which you can record on a tape recorder, take a photograph of, uh, make a videotape of, and so on. They're highly suspicious of, of the interpretative notions in the mind. And therefore, this is where my, my puzzles have been. What is the relationship between these objective facts out there in the world, which are, as it were, in a sense, in a sense, really objective, in the sense that you can actually record them and, and, and preserve them on, on tape recorder, and and the message buried, the argument that these behaviours, besides doing things, they, they you know, I mean, you do things in the sense that you you grow potatoes and, and, and you build a house and you actually alter the state of the world, uh, but also they say something. So that there is a whole coding involved in the way we, the food we eat, the, the dresses we wear, the kind of houses we live in, the way we arrange our houses. I mean, you don't, don't just go into a house and find all the rooms are the same. I mean, there's a, there's a living room, and there's a kitchen, and there's a privy, and there's a bedroom, and these have all very different values, and you can, there's a sort of coding pattern built into that. And the way rooms, buildings are arranged on the, on the ground. I mean that uh, pigsties are not, are not like uh, human houses. But if, if we want to be contemptuous of a human being, we say you're living in a pigsty and so on. You know? uh, and there's so much in the ordinary. Uh, material things we do, in the, uh, which the functionalist have paid so much, which is in fact concerned with giving messages rather than with just solving economic problems. And it's, it's this big change, I think, that, that, that nowadays you know, no one can entirely ignore. I mean, very much in, in the Malinowski tradition, it was how does the behaviours, the customary behaviours, how do they serve the needs of the individual and what was meant for us? How do they keep him alive? I mean, the basic need for the human being is to, uh, is to keep warm, eat food, procreate his species and, and not die. And you then showed that the whole of, of your cultural arrangements of the Trobian Islands just did this. Well, in a way, it's fairly obvious because if they didn't do that, there wouldn't be any Trobian Islanders to, to talk about. But, uh, but having shown this, and you showed a number of interesting things which previously people hadn't noticed of how, how things dovetail in together, what they tended to overlook was that all these behaviours are also saying things, communicating messages, and it is the nature of the message, how the coding, how the messages are coded, which underlies how the sort of structuralist element has got worked into the system. And I think most practicing anthropologists now, there has been a tremendous merging of these two schools in that most field anthropologists, whether they're American or French or English, now do very much the same sort of thing. And what they do is 
obviously derived from Van Lossky. It has more gadgets. It has you know, television cameras and tape recorders and all sorts of other things. But nevertheless, what they're doing is what Malinowski would have said his field workers ought to do. But now they go into the field assuming that part of their job is to try and understand the symbolic coding of what is built into the behavior as well as, uh, as just the, the materialist economic coding. And the symbolic coding is assumed to be in some way coded in a manner which is some, in some way related to linguistics. I mean, this is just how is, you know, the argument starts. So we've got, I mean, if I can put it this way, we have a, a level at which people are concerned with the very intricate problems of how things actually are on the ground. And then you've got the second level where people are, are persuaded also that the, the systematic arrangements carry a message. Uh, now, having got to that level, um, you're with your kind of thing and also in a measure with levi strauss kind of thing, but there's a very big difference between, still between what, what, what interests you or what you're trying to do and what he's trying to do, as I understand. Could you tell us what that difference is? You're not wholeheartedly a disciple. No, well, I, this is, of course, always, <laughs> always very difficult. Um, he, he seems to think that, and here I'm not sure that it, he would actually agree with what I say, but what he, what he seems to be thinking, he talks about the human mind, and he seems to be looking for um, features of social systems which arise direct from the fact that it is human beings who, who participate them, and any sort of human beings would do equally well. And it must be so, when he is able to uh, fit together, take the whole uh, mythology of, of the Americas, and actually says, in one way, this myth, which was recorded in the Amazon, only becomes comprehensible when it is put side by side with this other myth, which was recorded in Alaska, or, or somewhere up there. And now this must be that there is something universal about the, the mental operations of the of the human beings who created these two stories. There couldn't be any other. And he's able to make this comparison, quite in taking no notice of the fact that one myth was generated in the tropics in, in the Amazon and the other in, in, in the, in the semi-Arctic or something. Now, I'm very, very skeptical about this sort of thing. Um, I feel that, um, that there are certain very basic principles about uh, how these coding systems operate, but they're, they're, they're so basic that they're, they don't get you very, I mean, they're, they're as basic as the way the computers work. I mean, that um, flip-flop mechanism of computers and continuity, discontinuity. At that level, yes, there are universals about how we think, how we operate. Uh, but I would be very, very cagey about sort of just jumping about around the map and saying, oh, well, you know, that reminds me of that. I suppose your differences from Levi-Strauss are attributable not only to a very different formation, but to the fact that his base was linguistics and yours was engineering, and that makes a very big difference. Uh, I think so. I, but also, Mathematics. You see, uh, mathematicians assume that their abstractions uh, apply to the universe at large, regardless of whether human beings are there at all. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm entirely confident of this, but nevertheless, Levi Strauss is concerned because he's, he, he came into anthropology basically through linguistics, is concerned with abstraction as a phenomenon of the human mind. Whereas I'm looking all the time for models which are, don't really imply that the, the model maker must be human, though I know that the model maker is. And uh, this, I think, is where uh, thinking about society as a machine uh, really comes into it. Um, there's a, there's an, uh, an old tradition, of course, that 
anthropologists study primitive societies, uh, and uh, you know, if it, the ordinary people think that they do this, and that somehow primitives are they are simple societies. They're also an equivalent of simple societies, as opposed to as we are society, of course, is very large and very complex. Well, I think actually the justification for anthropology is exactly the reverse of this. I think that from a, a, a machine, an engineer's point of view, it is very plain that in the evolution of mechanism, mechanism did become more and more complicated until about the middle of the 18th century. The clockmakers of the middle of the 18th were extremely ingenious and extraordinarily elaborate variations of machinery. And then, because of the pressures of industrialization, it went right the opposite way and became simpler and simpler and simpler. And now, you, you, the only way you can hope to survive as an engineer is to produce a, a machine which is made of absolutely standardized parts which will all fit together and be used in umpteen different machines. And, of course, uh, the ultimate of this is, is the computer over here. Uh, which uses a principle which has been in fact, known to human beings since the uh, dot of just plus minus plus minus also alternation, and everything is there are no moving parts in in modern machines. I mean that uh, the, the the whole thing is is dr worked down to that level of abstraction. Uh, but do you think there's rather exact analogy between that? progression that you described towards simplicity and the relationships between primitive and so-called uh, complex societies? Well, what I think about so-called large societies, large, large society. industrial societies, are built on a sort of hierarchical principle, a nested principle, so that the very large organizations are structured in the same way as the very small organizations, so that the parish council is really just the same as the uh, as the cabinet in Whitehall and, and, and so on. I mean, the, the, the theory of organization is, is very stereotyped, and this can exist at various different levels. And uh, our modern societies reproduce the same structures over and over again. Otherwise, we, we, otherwise we wouldn't be able to understand them. It is we, it's only because they're very simple and, and repetitive that we can understand them. Now the interesting, the reason for being an anthropologist, social anthropologist, is not that in studying exotic societies you're studying simple societies. On the contrary, the point is that the, the exotic societies have not been pressurized all to become exactly the same. They're enormously varied. So you can only discover what the, the possibilities of variation in human behavior are by going to these exotic places, because all modern society, modern industrial societies, are exactly the same. I mean, you go to Tahiti, you land on the airport, you might as well be in Heathrow on a small scale. I mean, that there's nothing exotic about the, about the, about the uh, airfield in Tahiti. It's just like, I mean, why, why go to Tahiti? That's all happening. I mean, the point is, you was, it was go to some exotic place simply because to a part of the world where they're not constrained to be standardized. And this is really what I find fascinating about anthropology. But don't think I uh, let you think that I'm just a, a disguised structuralist. I'm interested in structuralism, but uh, my work in Salon, which I haven't mentioned, is uh, very much a, a study in the, in the functionalist tradition. I was, uh, carrying on an argument about how, whether kinship, not at all in terms of kinship terminology, but the organization of kinship was really a thing in itself or just an aspect of, of property relations. I annoyed some of my colleagues by saying that you can't study kinship at all. I mean, you're studying uh, property relations in a community, which is a very basic thing. And perhaps people are talking about these property relations within the language of kinship, but that's a very different thing. But this is far removed from, from structuralist analysis. But, but some, of your, some of your more recent work has, had, has been more akin to, I mean, superficially, at any rate, more akin to the sort of thing that Lady Swift does. Well, yes. I mean, I'm, um, what I do now, I mean, uh, you know, the, 
I can no longer do field work. You and I are of an age where it's not practical to go to exotic places. So I work with, as you do, with uh, literary materials and artistic materials. I'm particularly interested in the way uh, patterns are arranged on the ground, either in terms of the way buildings are arranged or in the way uh, art objects make their appeal or, leaning slightly in your direction, even literary exercises perhaps convey messages. Uh, I'm not, a, I mean, I'm not a literary structuralist, but I, I mean, my treatment of, a me, of biblical myth perhaps borders at times on what uh, literary structuralists are up to. You, you did write somewhere, as I read recently, that uh, on the whole your, your contemporaries in uh, English, British social anthropology were opposed to the kind of thing you did. Is that, is that so? You've already said that today that uh, to some extent their, their f enterprises in the field have been qualified by uh, the sort of thing that we've been talking about. They're not doing the same kind of thing that they did in Malinowski's day. But they are nevertheless, uh, on the whole, inclined to take a, an antagonistic position towards you. Yes, I think yeah. they are... Um, you know, the, 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 the subject moves on and uh, what present-day field anthropologists are, are doing is influenced by all sorts of things besides those I've been talking about. It's greatly influenced by neo-Marxism, a great stress on Mar neo-Marxist theory. It is greatly influenced by <laughs> by this vogue for feminism. I mean, the, the great argument that uh, the earlier generation of uh, social anthropologists ignored the position of women and misrepresented the position of women <coughs> gave an entirely male-orientated view. <coughs> well, this is rather true, but I mean, it, it's something we've been saying in criticism of Lady Strauss for a long time, for example. I mean, his theory of kinship was an exchange of women between groups of men, which is, Yes. Uh, I mean, you could <laughs> equally argue the exchange of men between groups of women, but, uh, but um, no, there are all sorts of ways in which the kind of thing I've been talking about is now considered rather old-fashioned, and uh, we're moving on to more fundamental matters. Uh, I don't know. I think that the I can never move on to something else. I mean, I'm, I my own view is this blend of functionalism and straddling the bridge between functionalism and structuralism. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Do you see, uh, you don't have any insight into what the next thing that's going to happen, the next important thing that's going to happen in the development of social anthropology? Um, no, because, I mean, clearly it's going to become more and more difficult to study exotic societies because exotic societies are disappearing. So whatever it is that anthropologists are going to do, they're going to have to find ways of applying their methods of study to more sophisticated social systems.